Welcome, welcome, greetings all. I'm, of course, Dr. Gentleman, an author and academic living and working in Tokyo, Japan. And this is the second episode of my new YouTube series, Great Works. Yes, yes, I do have to say it like that. Last time I asked you to send me any questions you might have, so let's start with a little Q&A. We're only just starting out, there's only about four of you watching this, so there's only one question. Do you really have a PhD? You doubt me? Yes, yes, I do really have a PhD. Here are some pictures of me graduating. Okay, I guess maybe I could just be dressing up for fun. So here's some footage of the ceremony. Come on, half you guys will believe the Thug Notes guy when he says he has a PhD, but me? Impossible. It's almost like I look like an idiot. Thug Notes is amazing, by the way. All right, let's crack on. Last time we looked at Shakespeare, who's pretty much generally accepted as the greatest writer in the English language. Not bad, not bad. Little clap for Shakespeare. Today we're going to look at arguably the greatest English novelist, Charles Dickens. Good old Charlie. Even if you've never read one of his books, you almost certainly know his stories, even if it's only through the Muppets Christmas Carol. Today I'm going to cover another one of his big resonant hits, often adapted for children. Oliver Twist. Or The Parish Boy's Progress. People liked having two titles for their books back then. Just like when I chose Romeo and Juliet, I'm starting out not with one of Dickens' greatest and most masterful works. For that, I'd probably choose Bleak House, uh, David Copperfield, uh, Great Expectations, but with one of his most popular. There's a couple of reasons for this. One is that this is one of Dickens' earliest books, and he was at his bravest back then, his most daring. Like Swedish author Henning Mankell wrote, there is a power in Oliver Twist that I believe Dickens never managed to retrieve. The second reason is that I'm on more comfortable ground with Oliver Twist. I have a very personal connection with the book and I read it at a very young age when the language was actually quite difficult for me. And the reason that I read it was that I was going to be in a production of the musical in London's West End. You see, for most of my childhood and teenage years, my dream was to be an actor. I still act sometimes, like here a couple of years ago when I had a small speaking part on a drama on Japanese TV. Humble brag! But mostly it was just something I did when I was a kid. Like here when I showed up in an ident for British TV with a baby Billy Piper from Doctor Who. Name draw! Anyway, probably the biggest thing I did was to be in a successful production of the musical Oliver in the London Palladium directed by Sam Mendes. Double name drop! Jonathan Price from Game of Thrones was Fagin. Triple name drop! Will he go for the quad? You bet I will. Here's little me with the other kids from the show. And oh, look at that. That's... Eddie Redmayne. Uh, I mean, future Oscar winner, Eddie Redmayne. Name drop explosion! I realize this is getting a bit silly, but you know, I've, I'm just starting out on YouTube. I've, I've got to make myself sound interesting somehow, right? And being close to famous people sometimes makes you interesting, right? Right? All right, enough. In the end, I mostly gave up acting because, well, Honestly, when I became an adult, I was more and more uncomfortable with the things I was expected to do in the name of acting. And to be honest, when I look back, a lot of the roles I got as a kid were really just token Asian kid, which sucked a little bit to realise. But the point is, this book has a personal significance to me. I even named the main character of my first novel after Oliver. So who was Dickens and why is he held in such high esteem? Well, actually, for, for academics, Dickens is in a bit of a strange position. He's not really respected, he's looked down on a little bit because he was a populist writer. It's not very well that his stories were so universally adored, but you know, he's not really on the level of Hardy, is he? It's no à la recherche du temps perdu. Now when Joyce came along and wrote books you need ten annotations per paragraph to even begin to understand, that's when real novel writing began. <sighs> you can probably tell, but I'm not a huge fan of modernism. For me, storytelling is what's absolutely primary in making a good novel, and you know, stylistic experimentation and sesquipedalian excess come way down the list. Dickens wrote easily digested, often hilarious, episodic page turners, and he did an absolutely superlative job of it. I will defend him to the grave. Fight me! Dickens was born in 1812 and spent most of his early childhood in Kent. Unfortunately, Charles was the second of eight kids, and there wasn't much of a social security net back in the time of George IV. So when his parents badly overspent and were sent to jail, or more specifically to debtor's prison, young Charles was sent to live with an old woman that the family knew, who lived in Camden Town, London. And at 12 years old he had to go to work. His job was basically to put labels on tins of what was essentially boot polish. Uh, dirty work in a, in a squalid, rat-infested warehouse that he would never forget. Things improved when his father got out of jail thanks to getting his inheritance. 
Charles went to school in London, got a job in a legal office as a clerk, and by the end of his teens had fallen in love with the theatre, especially with farce and comedy. He thought about becoming an actor, but it was his writing that had caught people's attention. After a publication called Monthly Magazine printed his short story, A Dinner at Poplar Walk, his Uncle Bill got him a job writing reports about goings on in Parliament. Soon he was travelling the country covering political campaigns, and writing humorous essays about the things he saw, which he called sketches. I suppose you could think of these as a kind of precursor to vlogs. Most of these were about London life and published under the pen name Bose. He put a few dozen of these together in a book called Sketches by Bose, though since it's spelt B-O-Z, B-O-Z for you Americans, not many people realise it was supposed to be Boz, so it's usually called Sketches by Boz. This went down pretty well, and Dickens got a new gig where he was supposed to match a story to a funny picture. Soon though, his storytelling was the greater draw, and the pictures had to match what he wrote. The series exploded in popularity when Dickens introduced a cheeky Cockney character called Sam Weller. These stories were put together into something called the Pickwick Papers, which stretches the term a little, but it's usually called Dickens' first novel. That's when he decided to do something a little more ambitious. With a reputation as a humorist and only a few short story collections behind him, he decided to draw on the more difficult chapters of his childhood and uh, his concerns for the most vulnerable sections of society and to write a book about them. At just 25 years old, while also finishing up the Pickwick Papers, editing a literary magazine and writing four different plays, he started to unfold the story of Oliver Twist. This guy knew how to hustle. One or two chapters were published per month in the magazine that Dickens was editing, Bentley's Miscellany. The book's opening is pretty famous. Oliver has grown up an orphan and is now old enough to be in a workhouse. Even the young children have to work, basically picking apart old ropes to reuse them, which is not only very boring labour, it's pretty painful on the hands too. One day the boys are feeling rebellious, so they decide to cast lots to decide which of them has to go up to the workhouse master and ask for a second helping of food. You've all seen the kid who grew up to be probably not the real father of Michael Jackson's kids. I want some more. More? For this act of sheer unbridled anarchy, young Oliver is locked up and is to be expelled from the workhouse. He's not sold like in the musical. Business owners are actually offered five pounds to take him on, which is quite a sum in those days. Mr. Bumble, the fearsome parish beadle, um, that's a, uh, that's a kind of Church of England sanctioned police officer, by the way. Not a, not a beagle or a beetle. What the hell did I just make? Mr. Bumble takes him to an undertaker called Mr. Sowbury, who basically just wants the five pounds, although he's delighted by how miserable Oliver looks, and thinks he'll make an excellent funeral mute, which is basically a professional mourner, especially for children's funerals. Yeah. And you thought Tim Burton made miserable stories. Actually, one of the best songs from the stage musical that didn't make it into the film version is sung by the undertaker. He's a born undertaker's mute. I can see him in his black silk suit. No more singing. Go and watch MatPat if you want a singing YouTuber. This new life actually promises a relatively bright future for Oliver. It's almost like it's worth acting up and getting turfed out of the workhouse. Yeah, that's right. I said it. I fully encourage revolution for any proletarian kid stuck in a pre-Victorian hellhole. Though Oliver does almost get placed with a chimney sweep who probably would have killed him. Uh, m m maybe you better stick with the unpicking ropes thing, kids. Maybe you can unionise and seize the means of production later. Even if this situation might have been a pretty good setup for Oliver, the problem is there's this other young man in the business called Noah Claypole, and he is a nasty, nasty young man. He's a pretty brutal bully of young Oliver, but you know, despite having done very little thus far except fall to his knees and weep, Oliver actually loses it when Claypole insults his mother, which is probably a, a pretty sore subject for a lot of orphans and he attacks him like an angry chihuahua that doesn't know he's tiny. Of course he gets a severe beating for his troubles, and with Mr. Bumble called back in, all hope of a better life is kind of fading away. Where is love? Baby don't hurt me. Oliver decides to sneak out and make a run for it, doing what English kids have done since the time of old Dick Whittington, and heading to London to seek his fortune. London is 70 miles from where he is, which probably puts him somewhere up near Peterborough. But he makes his way to the capital anyway, a malnourished nine-year-old walking 10 or 20 miles a day, sleeping rough and collapsing several times until some strangers take pity on him and give him some bread and cheese, but never a lift. At one point, people on a stagecoach go, okay, we'll give you some money if you run alongside the coach for a while. And he tries, but he collapses because he's so exhausted. And the people go, that wasn't very good. And they give him nothing. Yet he gets up and keeps going. 
If that doesn't get you on his side, I don't know what will. And it's a real shame that most adaptations leave out this struggle. After seven days of walking, he makes it to Barnet, just on the northern outskirts of London. You probably know what happens here. Oliver meets another boy of about his age or slightly older who charms his little raggedy socks off by calling him a flash companion and introduces him to a life of crime. This is Jack Dawkins, otherwise known as the Artful Dodger, a lovable rogue and pioneer of steampunk fashion who is everything that Oliver isn't. Brash, confident, capable, streetwise, and unlike most adaptations, lovable little charmer, a stumpy bow-legged kid with a snub nose and sharp little eyes. He is one of a pretty large group of pickpockets gathered together and organized by the even more lovable, even more roguishly charming Fagin. Right? Ah, Fagin. This is where things get a little bit more tricky. The first thing you should know is that in the original serials, Dickens almost never refers to Fagin by name. He just calls him the Jew. Fagin's Jewishness is integral to his character, or, or more accurately, the perceptions of what it means to be Jewish really inform his character. In the musical, it's Jewish humor that gets to be the biggest factor. He has all these hilarious songs that are very much in the tradition of, of you know, Broadway musicals, which are very much a Jewish-dominated area of entertainment. He's very personable and very likeable on the stage, and he has doubts about his criminality. Can a fellow be a villain all his life? Or the trials and tribulations? Better settle down and get myself a wife. And the wife would come and go, Sorry, I sang again. It's just a really fun musical. But yeah, this is a lovable outlaw who ends up going skipping off into the sunset, right? No! While it's true that Lionel Bart and others adapting this character for the stage and screen were able to mostly own and celebrate the character as a mostly harmless Jewish comic creation, who, even though he's a petty criminal, has a good heart underneath it all, that is not how Dickens wrote Fagin. Oh, no, 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 no! Here he is a nasty, nasty man! An exploitative, repugnant, cold-hearted creature, and in the end, they hang him. The first thing we learn about Fagin is that he is, and I quote, a very old, shriveled Jew, whose villainous looking and repulsive face was obscured by a quantity of matted red hair. And one of the first things he does is get out his collection of stolen jewellery and cackle at it, you know, babbling to himself about how proud he is of the young thieves who never squealed on him, even if they got sent to the gallows for what he made them do. Fagin is problematic to use that most popular of terms right now. Even allowing for the idea that Dickens was, you know, just just characterizing one particular individual character, possibly based on one very specific Jewish criminal, you really can't look past the prejudicial descriptions. Even in the musical that I was in, I mean, look at the logo. You know, it's, it's a very clever logo that I like quite a lot. You know, they've, they've used the title to make a portrait of Fagin's face, that's pretty clever, but ooh, they've made that L really big, haven't they? I actually, I, I dug my t-shirt out with this logo on, and then I put it back in the box. While Lionel Bart and Ron Moody were Jewish, Dickens, of course, was not. Identity politics is nothing new. And back then, too, there were people who were very concerned about the portrayal of Jewish people in the media. After discussing with a Jewish couple he sold his house to, Dickens seemed to realize that his portrayal was potentially harmful to a wider population, so he decided to tone things down. He actually ended up going back to what he'd written, and even though he didn't make any major changes to the character arc, he removed a lot of the stereotypically Jewish characteristics he'd given to Fagin, and changed many of the times he just referred to him as the Jew. And in his last novel, Our Mutual Friend, he did actually write some very sympathetic Jewish characters. So there's that, at least. Returning to the story, Oliver, bless his little raggedy stockings, actually thinks that Fagin and co are in the business of manufacturing wallets. Aww. So he is taken aback when he is sent out to do some pickpocketing. Dodger and his partner in crime, Charlie Bates, steal a fine pocket handkerchief from a fancy man and run away. But the man notices and turns around and sees Oliver. Oliver doesn't do playing it cool. He looks this man in the eye, panics and runs away. Smooth, kiddo. Obviously, he gets caught and dragged before the local magistrate. Things were done very quickly back then. Luckily, a witness clears Oliver's name, but despite his 70-mile walk, our little Ollie still has a bit of a delicate disposition, so all the stress just makes him faint there on the stand. The fancy fellow, whose name is Mr. Brownlow, named after the director of the Foundling Hospital at the time, feels pretty bad about all this and decides to take the young urchin in. This was the early 1800s. Clearly, if you were rich, it was fine to just take some kid home. Luckily, Mr. Brownlow is a genuinely good guy, and he looks after the little mite with more kindness than he's ever known in his whole life. Will it last? Oh, of course it won't. Oliver knows about Fagin. He knows about the racket. It 
cannot be allowed to run his little mouth to his fancy new pretend family. So Fagin decides to get him back, sending his fellow criminal Bill Sykes to grab the kid. Sykes is a nasty, nasty man, and actually one of the easiest ways in adaptations to make Fagin more likeable is to actually make Sykes into the real bad guy. You know, the bigger criminal extorting the lovable small-time con man? Clearly, Fagin has to keep robbing because he has to pay Sykes protection money. You see that a little in the musical, but much more clearly in Disney's anthropomorphic version, Oliver and Company. But that's not in the novel. They're pretty equal here. Fagin definitely gets to keep all of his ill-gotten gains, and it's quite possible that Sykes used to be in his gang. He catches Oliver with the help of Nancy, a stout teenage thief, formerly of Fagin's gang, who Dickens implied in the text, but later confirmed is a prostitute, with a very good heart, but before that cliché was commonplace. Sykes and Fagin's kids take Oliver's nice new clothes and the money that Mr. Brownlow's given him, and it's only Nancy that stops them from beating him into a pulp. Later, Sykes takes Oliver with him to rob a house, squeezing him through the window so that he can unlock the door from the inside. Oliver is a terrible criminal though, and gets spotted and shot in the arm. Sykes actually makes quite an effort to save Oliver here, grabbing him and attempting to get away and ultimately hiding him in a ditch, so I guess there is some some degree of uh, solidarity between thieves here. But Oliver decides that his only chance is to stumble back to the house, and once again being tiny and kind of adorable makes everyone take pity on him, and the people he tried to rob start looking after him. This is where the little twist in the plot comes. By sheer coincidence such as never been seen in fiction before or since, turns out Oliver is not actually a destitute little orphan. His mother Agnes was actually quite a well-to-do and beautiful young lady from a military family, but she got pregnant with Oliver out of wedlock, so she decides to have a baby in secret and ends up collapsing in the street and then dying in childbirth. The lockets and rings she left, which were meant to identify the child, were stolen by the old midwife, and when she died, Mrs. Corney, the workhouse matron who would later become Mrs. Bumble, got her pudgy hands on them. At this point in the story, a mysterious man comes and buys them, and then throws them into the River Thames. Maybe he could have left them where they were, but it seems like Mr. Brownlow is starting to sniff around about Oliver's identity. The mysterious man, who calls himself Monks, is not satisfied with just this, so he teams up with Fagin to abduct Oliver again. Bill Ollie, by this point, is getting on quite well with the family that Sykes tried to rob, the Maylies. Nancy overhears this insidious plot and decides she is not going to stand for it. She goes to tell the Maylies, who decide to enlist the help of Mr. Brownlow, who, uh, who Oliver introduced them to when they met on the street. Mr. Brownlow and the youngest Maylie, Rose, decide to meet up with Nancy again to discuss how to deal with monks. But! You remember that nasty Undertaker's apprentice, Noah Claypole? Well, by coincidence, he ended up in Fagin's gang too. Maybe he did the same 70 mile walk. And he has followed Nancy to hear what she says. He then goes to tell Fagin, and Fagin tells Sykes, and you know Fagin is gonna make this sound as bad as possible. Go Noah, tell him how Nancy was meeting with two suspicious characters on the bridge. Oh, and don't forget to mention how uh, she said that Bill was stopping her coming out to meet people. Oh, you won't be too violent, Bill. You most likely know what happens next. Bill Sykes kills Nancy smashes her face open with a pistol, and then he clubs her to death. Sykes doesn't last that much long either. He abandons, almost kills his dog Bullseye, and then he flees to the countryside. But he comes back thinking he can steal some of Fagin's money to get himself overseas. But Nancy's murder was actually a big deal, even in this criminal underbelly of London. When he shows his face, he's chased by an angry mob, and while he's trying to climb off a rooftop, he falls and hangs himself. Maybe by accident, Maybe not. To make it worse, Bullseye sees his old master and tries to jump over to him from the roof, misses, and plunges to his death. It's a good thing all dogs go to heaven, because he was a pretty bad doggo. Sykes' death is usually the big climax of adaptations, usually because he grabs Oliver from somewhere to shoehorn him into the action. But Dickens' version is simpler, maybe less elegant on the, uh, on the storytelling front, but to my mind it's a lot bleaker. Mr. Brownlow is essentially Oliver's guardian angel, and he confronts Mr. Monks, and that's when the truth comes out. Monks is actually the son of Oliver's father by his wife, not by his mistress, so that makes him Oliver's half-brother. His real name is Edward Leaford, and he means to get his hands on the money that Oliver stands to inherit. Now this is possible because the will written by Oliver's father says that his illegitimate son can inherit half of his fortune, if and only if he has never committed any public act 
of dishonor, meanness, cowardice, or wrong. After writing this will for the sake of his mistress and unborn child, he then passed away overseas. So Oliver's whole life, he could have actually received this money if only he'd known. But if Leaford gets Oliver to commit a crime, then all the money defaults to him. But of course, Ollie Dearest is much too kind-hearted for that. And now the truth is out. Knowing Oliver doesn't really care for the money, Mr. Brownlow suggests the two half-brothers split what's left of it, and Oliver happily agrees to that. It's enough for Leaford to set off for America, though being a nasty, nasty man, he's bound to waste it all anyway and end up in jail. Mr. Brownlow and Oliver are such enablers. Meanwhile, Fagan's gang has been thoroughly Busted. A few chapters back, Dodger was caught stealing a snuff box, and he's sentenced to be shipped to a penal colony. This is a terrible, terrible fate, because it's probably Australia. Fagin too is behind bars at the end of the story, waiting to be executed. He's alone and waiting to die, just like the boys that he trained who got caught before he did. Fagin can't find any human connection, any modicum of sympathy from anyone who looks at him, so he's slowly losing his mind. No skipping off into the sunset here. Some remnants of Fagin's gang, like Charlie Bates and Noah Claypole, actually go straight, and they end up having pretty decent lives. And Oliver gets adopted by Mr. Brownlow, who we can easily tell will bring him up right. Oh, and by sheer coincidence, Mr. Brownlow almost married Oliver's aunt. And Rose Maley, the other person targeted for a crime that Oliver happened to get mixed up in, turns out to have been adopted. And she is Oliver's aunt. Not the same one Mr. Brownlow almost married, uh, another aunt. Yet somehow I can't begrudge Dickens all the silly coincidences when Oliver says to Rose, you're not my aunt, but you're my sister, and everyone has a big group hug. Even grief itself arose so softened and clothed in such sweet and tender recollections that it became a solemn pleasure and lost all character of pain. Dickens didn't really do subtle, but he made melodrama very cute. Despite being essentially written on the fly, this is a pretty neat story, and the fast-paced serialised composition makes it interesting to read all the way through. There are some very funny sections, probably the most frenetic action sequences of any Dickens work, and of course the trademark Dickens characters with the silly names. While Dickens is often criticised for having exaggerated characters, P.G. Wodehouse describing old Pop Bassett as more like something out of Dickens than anything human, few people wrote characters as deftly as he did. Often they're very simple but absolutely iconic, and of course not all of these characters can be described as two-dimensional, even if many can. Despite the questionable portrayal of Fagin, this is also Dickens at his most righteous and satirical. He takes aim at the hypocrisies of Regency society, and he is unafraid of not only evoking crime, poverty and suffering, but actually exploring the nuances of whether a supposedly fallen woman can actually be a good person, and whether wealthy men can actually be rotten to the core and still very greedy. Dickens wants his audiences to question the injustices of his society, the gap between rich and poor, and to see how wrong it is for a pauper child at a glance to be despised by all and pitied by none. Progressive! But there's one big problem at the core of Oliver, aside from Fagin, especially if it's taking aim at the hypocrisy of an uneven society, and that's Oliver's backstory. If Dickens wants us in the first English novel ever to feature a child protagonist, to come to understand and sympathise with a typical pauper child who has a good heart, he kind of undermines that by revealing that Oliver is not actually typical. He doesn't belong there. Big twist, he's actually rich. His genes are good, so he's a little angel, even surrounded by scoundrels. Granted, it was almost certainly before he'd planned that big revelation, but Dickens wrote, nature, or inheritance, had planted a good sturdy spirit in Oliver's breast. It had plenty of room to expand, thanks to the spare diet. And look, he gets a happy ending where he actually inherits lots of money and is taken in by a nice middle-class chappy. Yes, the sun might shine its equal ray through costly coloured glass and paper-mended window, but that doesn't make this pre-Victorian society equal. I can see how this narrative has grown out of what Dickens experienced as a child, but it seems to run counter to what he wanted to achieve. In the end, the reader is left feeling not that Oliver is a good example of somebody who is born penniless, yet has a very noble spirit, but gets the impression that the only way to escape from poverty is for it to be revealed that your dad is loaded. Or at the very least, that someone in a better position has to reach down and help you to your feet, which is probably closer to what he intended. 
private benevolence must rescue children from the corruptive forces of society, as Burton M. Wheeler puts it. And ultimately, Dickens didn't set the story up to be a perfect moral fable. It's primarily an adventure, and another sketch, and, you know, of a part of London that it was quite brave for a young writer known primarily for comedy to be highlighting a good 20 years before Les Miserables did the same thing for Paris. And there is no doubt that Dickens succeeds spectacularly at evoking a particular time and place, perhaps too spectacularly, because he, his writing kind of creates these myths about what 19th century London was like. As Judith Flanders wrote of Dickens, nobody would be able to see London again except through his eyes. Ultimately, Oliver Twist, like the eponymous orphan, charms everybody and makes them care. That immediacy, that instantly recognisable cast, and the desire, even if it was flawed, to illuminate the plight of the most desperately needy, to try and bring about an end to inequality. That's what makes this a great work. Okay, that's all for today. Thank you for watching. I'm worried this one will be even more excessively long than the last one, even if I'm told that long content is the way to go in YouTube in 2018. Anyway, please do all the usual YouTube stuff, and I've left my email down in the description, so please use that to send me any questions you might have about me, or about literature, or about whatever the dickens you like. And I will see you next time for another great work.